Hey, good morning, everyone. This is Brad Berzer. I hope you guys are all doing well and staying safe and uh, enjoying your time with your family. Before we get started, so this is American Heritage, and I'll be finishing up the Civil War today. Uh, I would like to say just a couple of things as we get started. So, number one, uh, please do not forget that you have your midterm this Friday. So, again, I am presuming unless you've contacted me, and two people have contacted me, but unless you You've contacted me, you will be taking your exam at 10 o'clock at 10 o'clock Eastern Time if you're in the 10 o'clock section, and at 11 o'clock Eastern Time if you're in the 11 o'clock section. So once again, if there's a problem with that, don't hesitate to let me know as uh, as soon as possible. So two of you have arranged for other test taking times, and that's totally fine, but I do need to know, otherwise I'm gonna be expecting everything to come back within the hour after I've sent it to you on that day. So uh, hopefully this, this is enough warning. Morning. So the second thing to remember is that midterm is Friday. <laughs> so uh, I hope that you're getting ready for that, maybe studying with one another, and uh, I appreciate that. Okay, the, the third thing I want to note, it's a little bit more awkward, but uh, I just want to address, I realize that several of you are not happy with this format of me lecturing and then posting these videos on YouTube, and I am sorry about that. I, I don't really know what else to do. We were asked by the administration that if we did a class that was not recorded, that we do the class only at the time that our class is scheduled. And I have people in this class spread out all the way to Hawaii. And uh, I, I don't think that it would be fair to teach that course uh, and, and make people so spread out to meet at the same time. So I, I just can't see that happening, even though I realize that it would be better spontaneity if we were all on something like Zoom, uh, if, if I could even handle Zoom. But that's the other question. And I also just want to let you know, just so you guys don't think that, yeah, there's anything else uh, other than this going on. Uh, I'm recording all of this on an internet system that also has to handle my wife, who's teaching three courses as well as a full load. And two of my children, Nathaniel and Gretchen, who are full-time students and taking a full load. In fact, I think Nathaniel's even taking something like 20 hours or 21 hours. Um, so we are absolutely maxing out our internet. And once again, I realize that, and I appreciate you guys emailing me and telling me you were frustrated, uh, but I just, I, I don't know what else to do. So I am doing my absolute best, I promise you, doing my absolute best to make these as interesting and entertaining as possible. This is new for me too. Uh, I feel like when I'm staring into the camera here, it's like staring into the eyes of the abyss. So I'm trying to do the best too. But anyway, I apologize. I know this is not what any of you signed up for for the year. It's not what I signed up for either. This is not what I expected my career to be at this point. Uh, but we're all just trying to make the best of it. So I hope you understand and will forgive me for my own limitations in terms of technology and what I'm trying to do here as well. Okay, having said that, I am going to try tomorrow, uh, so I'm recording this, this is the, the last day of March, so the class I'm actually recording this for because I want it to be ready for you to be able to watch it during your time. The class I'm recording this for is for the April 1st, April 1st, uh, 10 and 11 o'clock sections, but I am recording this on March 31st. However, tomorrow on April 1st, uh, from 3 to 4 Eastern Time p.m., so 3 to 4 in the afternoon Eastern Time, I will have on uh, the computer on Zoom. And if any of you need to get a hold of me for kind of uh, virtual office hours, especially before the exam, please don't hesitate to get on. Obviously, uh, there are limitations with Zoom. Uh, we can't have that many people on, and you won't be private. But other than that, just know that I'll be there from 3 to 4 tomorrow afternoon on Zoom. And if you want to ask questions or get a hold of me, please do so. 
Okay, I think that's it for getting into this class and at least giving you an idea of what's going on on my end. Once again, regardless, I am truly hoping that you're all doing well. I miss you guys very much. Believe me, I would really much rather be in the classroom with you than this. But again, uh, life is what it is. And uh, why the virus uh, came now, I, I can't say, but it's here. And so we're just trying to deal with it the best we can. All right, when I left you on Monday's class, we were looking at Gettysburg and what was going on with Abraham Lincoln there. And I would like to turn now to your reader once again. And specifically, I would like to turn to the, the second inaugural dress that we have from Abraham Lincoln. And this is on page 501. So please turn to 501 in your reader. And if you look at the, the second full paragraph there, I want to read quite a bit of this, but I, I think it's an absolutely gorgeous statement. In fact, uh, I would go so far as to argue that this is one of the single most important documents in American heritage here, uh, not only for what it says, but for how it says it. And Lincoln, you can see his real genius here, his ability to write. He says in that second paragraph, line 11, on the occasion corresponding to this four years ago, so the Civil War, of course, lasts from 1861, April, uh, uh, late March of 1861, all the way until April to June, depending on where the surrenders were, of 1865. So those four years, 61 through 65, are the American Civil War. And during that war, of course, as I hope you've had a chance to read in your background text, if you have it, uh, during that war, we have close to 3 million men in arms. And if you real, if you think about that, the, the population of the United States at that point is 30 million. So 3 million men out of 30 million people are in arms during that war. This is a massive, massive war. And we know that during that civil war, roughly 620 to 700,000 men died. So it, these are absolutely astounding numbers. So anywhere from about 620,000 to 700,000, we don't know exactly how many, but we know that it's a huge number. Again, somewhere between six and 700,000 men died during this war. This was an incredibly brutal, bloody war. So on this occasion, corresponding to this four years ago, all thoughts were anxiously directed to an impending civil war. All dreaded it. All sought to avert it. While the inaugural address was being delivered from this place, devoted altogether to saving the Union without war, insurgent agents were in the city seeking to destroy it without war, seeking to dissolve the Union and divide effects by negotiation. Both parties deprecated war. But one of them would make war rather than let the nation survive, and the other would accept war rather than let it perish. And the war came. One-eighth of the whole population were colored slaves, not distributed generally over the Union, but localized in the southern half of it. These slaves constituted a peculiar and powerful interest all knew that this interest was somehow the cause of war. Now, that, that's a key sentence from Abraham Lincoln. They all knew that somehow this was the cause of war. To strengthen, perpetuate, and extend was... I'm sorry, because forgive me. To, per to strengthen, perpetuate, and extend this interest was the object for which the insurgents would rend the Union even by war, while the government claimed no right to do more than to restrict the territorial enlargement of it. Neither party expected for the war the magnitude or the duration which it had already attained. Neither anticipated that the cause of the conflict might cease with or even before the conflict itself should cease. For each looked for an easier triumph and a result less fundamental and astounding. Both read the same Bible and pray to the same God, and each invokes his aid against the other. 
It may seem strange that any men should dare to ask at just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces. But let us judge that we be not judged. The prayers of both could not be fully answered. That of neither has been answered fully. The Almighty has his own purposes. Woe unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offenses come. If we shall suppose that American slavery is one of those offenses which, in the providence of God, must needs come, but which, having continued through his appointed time, he now wills to resolve, and that he gives both to north and south this terrible war as the woe due to those by whom the offense came, shall we discern therein any departure from those divine attributes which the believers in a living God ascribe to him? Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray, that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet if God wills that it continue, until all the wealth piled by the bondman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword, as was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And then Lincoln gives us this incredible statement with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the light, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and a lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Now, of course, he is going to be assassinated just about a month later. But here we have Abraham Lincoln truly at his finest, arguing in favor of allowing for charity to resolve this issue, even after we've had the death of anywhere from 620,000 to 700,000 soldiers and civilians on the battlefield, even after that grotesque injustice to so many people, may we finally get real justice, real meaning out of this. And of course, he has in mind here the 13th Amendment, that amendment not as had been proposed in 1861, but now as will become a part of the U.S. Constitution, that amendment to end the, the terrible injustice of slavery. And yet, how do we do that? How does a nation go from having 4 million of its 30 million people enslaved to allowing freedom for all of those people, many of them who cannot read and write, many of those who have never lived under anything even approaching freedom? How is that going to happen? And it's not going to be easy by any means. But Lincoln wants us to think about what is most charitable. What is the will of God? And how do we live that out? How do we make that real? The war itself is, as I mentioned a little bit ago, an absolutely brutal war. One of the reasons that the war is so brutal is because, of course, it's a civil war. Civil wars are always the most intense of all wars because the war is so personal and there is no way to escape that personal element where you can sometimes literally have a brother fighting a brother in the war. And we often think of dividing the sides into blue and gray, North and South, Union and Confederacy, but it's never, of course, that easy. Uh, there are always all kinds of factors going on. And as Lincoln said, towards the beginning of the war, the essence of secession is anarchy. And the idea that somehow, once secession began, that there would simply be this kind of movement towards a unity of one side against the other was nothing but a pipe dream. 
Because once you start having the idea that anyone can break away, well then truly anyone can break away. And that becomes one of the most dangerous elements of the war. Not that we would have a North and a South, but instead that we would have many, many sides fighting with each other. And we do know that there were secession movements in Manhattan, in New York City. There were secession movements in the old Northwest Territory. Those uh, city uh, states that came out of the Northwest Ordinance, there were at times desires to make them fully independent into an old Northwest Confederacy. Texas never really in any kind of faithful way joined the Confederacy. For them, being a part of the Confederacy was always an act of convenience, and they would have gladly allowed the North and the South to destroy one another so that Texas could reclaim her empire in the West and have that empire running from basically Austin all the way to L.A., or even to San Francisco. So they were very fine with the destruction of the Union. You have American Indian tribes who some side with the North, some side with the South, but they too really just want to be left alone. You have Missouri and you have Kentucky, both of which attempt to try and find some kind of neutrality. In Kentucky's neutrality, they more or less align themselves with the North, but in Missouri's neutrality, they more or less align themselves with the Confederacy. In one county in Missouri, uh, there was a, a county not too far from St. Louis. It's to the west, and if I remember right, just a little bit south, but it could be a little bit north, but it is to the west of St. Louis. You have a county there where the entire county seceded from both the north and the south and declared itself an independent kingdom for the remainder of the Civil War. And they even appointed a king, the old patriarch of this area. They named a king, and both northern and southern armies tried to invade this county, but the family there with their extended kin network was able to drive off both Union and southern invaders and for all intents and purposes did remain an independent kingdom within the United States during the Civil War. So these were the kinds of things that were possible. Not just two sides, but a thousand sides. And yet it does focus, the energies do concentrate and they do focus more or less on a north and south. That really begins about two years into the war. We start seeing the homogenization of both the northern army and the southern army within itself, that is, the Northern Army within the Northern Army and the Southern Army within the Southern Army, about 1863. And 1863 is a key year for all kinds of reasons. Uh, it's the year that the North was able not to lose Gettysburg. It was the year that the North was able to take Vicksburg, the largest fortress the Confederates had in the American South. But it was also the year, very, very importantly, it was also the year in which blacks on the battlefield as Union soldiers were able to demonstrate that they too were worthy of bearing arms. And once they are worthy of bearing arms, you guys should all remember back to Lexington, the moment a man bears arms, he is free. Uh, that has been one of the oldest traditions of the West, and certainly America buys into that tradition. So remember, as I talked about two days ago in class, that Abraham Lincoln started the war by really believing that blacks were inferior peoples, and he did not know what he could do constitutionally or morally to make blacks equal to whites. Then we get into the second year of the war, 1862, and the Union has suffered serious defeats throughout that year in all kinds of places, north and south, it has suffered defeats. And Abraham Lincoln, as he approaches the election. Now, he himself is not up for election, but the House is up for an election, and a third of the senators are. In the fall of 1862, Lincoln has what we read in the Heritage Reader, that divine meditation or that revelation, depending on how we want to interpret it, in which Lincoln realizes that the way the North has been fighting the war is not the way that God would choose or God would have already ended the war 
in one way or another. But because God continues the war, there must be a different purpose to the war, one that no one has yet fathomed. And it is only two weeks later that Abraham Lincoln issues to his cabinet and then reveals to the American Republic what is known as the Emancipation Proclamation, which is to go into effect on January 1st of 1863. And what that Emancipation Proclamation said was that any areas that are in hostile activities towards the United States government, in those areas, all peoples who are enslaved are automatically emancipated and declared free. Now, there has been a lot of debate about what Lincoln was trying to do with this. Some people have argued that it was really kind of just a a, a, a unitarian, uh, utilitarian kind of measure, that it was just a war measure, that Lincoln really didn't mean to free the blacks. If he had, he would have freed blacks everywhere and not just in the war-torn areas. But remember, from Lincoln's perspective, he does not have the constitutional right to end slavery until someone declares war against the United States government. And then, as an occupying force, he has, as commander-in-chief, the right to do what he wants with the labor that is within that area. So it's actually perfectly logical that Lincoln would only abolish slavery in those areas that were in rebellion, because those would be the only areas where he had the constitutional authority to manumit, to free those slaves. But this changes a lot for Lincoln. Not only do we know that that Emancipation Proclamation worked its way through the South and ultimately ended up freeing about one out of every four Southern slaves, they took advantage of this, about a million of the four million slaves in the South did something, either ran away or fought on the Union side. Uh, They did something to show that they were no longer enslaved. But even more importantly than this, in 1863, Lincoln, fully understanding the Western tradition of manhood and virtue, recognized that the only way, the only serious way that Blacks could ever earn their freedom. So imagine this. Just think about the dilemma, the catch-22 here. If whites suddenly said to blacks, you're all free. Well, blacks might be appreciative, but they'd also be really resentful. Wait a minute. We, We did nothing to earn this. This was just handed to us by the very people who oppressed us. But if blacks had ever fully revolted against whites, then there would be an absolute bitterness on the other side. Whites would think, we never really mistreated you in any physical way, though of course they did, but they would be resentful of this and they would say, why did you have to overthrow us through such bloodshed and violence? And no matter what, if whites gave blacks freedom or if blacks took freedom on their own, there would always be this terrible form of resentment. So Lincoln comes up with this great solution. Put blacks in uniform and see what they do. Now, this is a political risk because many people believe that blacks were not men in any kind of physical sense, and therefore, the moment that they were in danger during battle, they would run. And it would absolutely make blacks look even worse if black men in uniform ran from the battle. So this is really a dilemma for Lincoln. But Lincoln contacts Governor Andrews, the most radical of governors, who was the governor of Massachusetts. And he says to him, "Uh, we need to do this. We need to start putting black men in arms. I cannot do this politically, but you, through the state, can form regiments. And therefore, through the state, you can form all black regiments. And Governor Andrews does. He forms what will become known as the 54th and the 55th Massachusetts. All black regiments, at least all black enlisted soldiers, some white officers, but all black soldiers. And these blacks go into battle in the spring of 1863. And not surprisingly, in the least, they do extremely well. In no way should this surprise anyone. I mean, even beyond the question, the absurd questions of race and racialism, uh, blacks had 
everything to fight for and nothing to lose in the Civil War. And they fought like that. They fought beautifully. They fought like mad in the best way. And yet they kept getting these cruddy battle assignments, a little skirmish here or a little skirmish there, something on this island or on that island. And they wanted something dramatic. And it came when the United States decided, and this was a, a crazy decision from any kind of strategic or tactical standpoint, but the United Sta States decided it would launch a full infantry assault on one of the most heavily fortified fortresses in the South, a fort called Fort Wagner in the, the Bay of Charleston. So just to the South of Charleston, there was this great naval fort, Wagner, that they were going to to attack. And the idea was that naval ships out on the coast would bombard this fort and soften it. And then uh, sometime around July 18th, infantry would enter this fort and take it through hand-to-hand -hand combat. And the 54th Massachusetts volunteered for this, knowing completely that this was a suicide run, but they had to prove their manhood. And so they line up on the beach, the order is given, and 1,000 men in the regiment in the 54th Massachusetts rush towards this fort. The fort had not been softened at all. The Confederates open fire, and they are able within about 20 minutes to wipe out about 80%, about 800 of the men trying to rush into the fort. But what's amazing about this, and here's where, in many ways, myth becomes so much greater than reality. But what's truly amazing is that about 20 of this regiment not only made it to the fort, but was able to scale the walls and enter into the fort in hand-to-hand -hand combat. I mean, these guys, this is like Batman on steroids. This is amazing that they were able to do this. And of course, once they're in the fort, they're so outnumbered that they're all killed, but they made it into the fort. And you can imagine the surprise on the eyes of the white Confederate soldiers as black men in uniform about 19 of them storm over the walls into their own fort and go into hand-to-hand -hand combat. The Confederates, in order to dishonor the head of the 54th Massachusetts, a white man, a Harvard graduate by the name of Robert Gould Shaw, in order to dishonor him, at least they think, they create a mass burial pit in which all of the blacks who had been killed in Fort Wagner are buried anonymously with their white officer. And the Southerners sing this kind of song about how he was really not a white man, he was a black man, and he betrayed his race. And amazingly enough, and, and this is what's so chilling, but amazingly enough, that song becomes the marching song for all black troops for the last two years of the war. They sing that song, <laughs> that horrible racist song. They sing it as a victory cry as they go into battle. And for the last two years of the war, the United States never could have had the kinds of victories that it had over the Confederacy without the thousands upon thousands of black troops who now fully, legally, legitimately, and with open arms and being welcomed by whites, flooded in to the US military ranks. So we know in the last two years of the war, black troops had a high, uh, slightly higher kill ratio of the enemy during battle. They also had a slightly higher wounded rate on their own, meaning that they were fighting just a little bit better and a little bit more fiercely than white troops were at the same time. So those things reveal a lot about who and what these people were. And Lincoln's genius really does come to the floor because here we have him saying, the best way to overcome this dilemma of white versus black is simply to allow blacks to prove themselves on the battlefield. And I cannot stress to you, I mean, no matter what I say, it would not be hyperbolic enough to stress to you, the students, 
how critical those deaths on April 18th of 1863 are at Fort Wagner, right? When a thousand black men die in that afternoon, they change the entire understanding of slavery. They change the entire understanding of racism. And of course, we'll go back to racism. Unfortunately, it seems to be a crazy and horrible part of the human condition. Maybe that's another topic, but regardless, there is a moment there and blacks are welcome into the army. And even a, a a magazine like the Atlantic Monthly, after writing about this idea of what happened at Fort Wagner in the September of 1863 issue of the Atlantic Monthly, it subtitles its piece, Blacks Prove Manhood. Uh, and that, that was just a Republican way of thinking. You, you have to die for your cause to prove that you're worthy of freedom. And that's exactly what they do. Well, as the war comes to a conclusion, in 1865, in the spring of 1865, especially in March of 1865, the main forces of the United States are all outside of Petersburg, Virginia, and they are entrenched. The Union forces are entrenched. The Southern forces are entrenched. Still Lee against Grant, Robert E. Lee for the South, Ulysses S. Grant for the North. There are other troops still moving. Sherman's troops are moving in the South. Joe Johnson's moves, uh, troops are moving in the South. But the vast majority of the troops are all centered around the area of Richmond and Petersburg in Virginia. And Lincoln calls a meeting with his two head generals, with Grant and with William Tecumseh Sherman. And they meet, and this is a term you guys need to know, they meet on a boat called the River Queen. So the River Queen is on the Potomac. Lincoln meets with Grant and Sherman, and he says to them, I want this war over. It's got to end soon. Uh, how are we going to do this? What, what are we going to do to make sure that this war can end as quickly as possible? Lincoln said, I have seen enough of the horrors of war. And I hope that Lee is beginning to realize how futile this fighting is, and I would like to see the beginning of the end. He said, this has been the most anxious experience of my life. Every day I wake up afraid every morning that I will hear that Lee has gone and that the war will be prolonged for another year. Must there be more bloodshed? Cannot one more bloody battle be avoided? And Grant and Sherman assured the president, unfortunately, no, they said, there would have to be at least one more desperate and bloody battle. And Lincoln at this cried. He said, my God, my God, can't you spare more effusions of blood? We have had so much of it. And then as he says this, he tells Grant and Sherman what his vision for the end is. And remember when I read about a half hour ago, the inaugural address, Lincoln said that there would be malice toward none and charity toward all. Lincoln means this. Even after four years of bloody, brutal civil war, Lincoln wants nobody arrested. He wants nobody imprisoned. He wants no trials. He wants everybody to go home. And we call this the River Queen Doctrine. So here's what he says at the River Queen Doctrine. He tells the men, that is Sherman and Grant, I want to get these deluded men of the rebel armies disarmed and back to their homes. Let them once surrender and reach their homes, and they will never take up arms again. Let them all, let them all go. Officers enlisted. I want submission, but no more bloodshed. I want no one punished. Treat all liberally. We want these people to return to their allegiance to the Union and submit to her laws. Right? That is the River Queen doctrine. Even after all this fighting, doesn't matter if Robert E. Lee's been a traitor or not, get him home get him back to his wife, get him back to his farm, and do this with everybody. And this had actually been the modus operandi for both Lincoln and Sherman, uh, excuse me, for Grant and Sherman. When they were in the battlefield, the last thing they wanted to do was take prisoners of war. So almost always, they would merely take those people who had lost the battle, make them sign a document, a document that would assure at least that these people had sworn, sworn, sworn an oath that they would go back home. 
and not fight at all. But Lee does want to try to surrender. And on April 1st of 1865, he makes a break for it with his troops. They leave their entrenched position and they start moving as quickly as they can to the west, trying to reach a little tiny fork in the road called Appomattox. And they're trying to get to a courthouse there, Appomattox Courthouse, where they believe that they will receive supplies. But when they get there, they find out that the Union has already taken that. They arrive on April 9th, and they find that the Union has gotten there first. There are no supplies. And so after four years of intense warfare, Lee surrenders. Now, if this were a normal semester, I would most certainly not be lecturing to you right now through my Macintosh. And I wouldn't even be lecturing to you in the classroom. We would have all put our jackets on, and it's a pretty nice day, actually. It's cloudy, but it's it's relatively warm. We would have all put our, our jackets on, and we would be having class out by the Civil War statue at this moment. If you look at the front of the Civil War statue on campus, its relief is that of Lee surrendering to Grant. It is one of the great moments in world history. And this is what Grant, who is the victor, writes about this. He says, I had known General Lee in the old army and had served with him in the Mexican War, but did not suppose, owing to the difference in our age and rank, that he would remember me, while I would more naturally remember him distinctly because he was the chief of staff of General Scott in that war. When I had left camp that morning, I had not expected so soon the result that was then taking place, and consequently was in my field garb. I was without a sword, as I usually was when on horseback in the field, and I wore a soldier's blouse for a coat, and when the shoulder straps were there, they indicated that I was a part of the army to which I belonged. When I went into the house, I found General Lee. We greeted each other, and after shaking hands, took our seats. I had my staff with me, a good portion of whom were in the room during the whole of the interview. What General Lee's feelings were, I do not know, as he was a man of much dignity, with an impassable face. It was impossible to say whether he felt inwardly glad that the end had finally come, or felt sad over the result and was simply too manly to show it. Whatever his feelings, and of course, here's Lee, the ultimate stoic, whatever his feelings, they were entirely concealed from my observation. But my own feelings, which had been quite jubilant on the receipt of his letter, were sad and depressed. I felt like anything rather than rejoicing in the downfall of a foe who had fought so long and valiantly and suffered so much for a cause, though that cause was, I believe, one of the worst for which a people ever fought and one for which there was the least excuse. I do not question, however, the sincerity of the great mass of those who were opposed to us. General Lee was dressed in a full uniform, which was entirely new, and he was wearing a sword of considerable value, very likely the sword which had been presented by the state of Virginia at the beginning of the war. At all events, it was an entirely different sword from the one that would ordinarily be worn in the field. In my rough traveling suit, the uniform of a private with the straps of a lieutenant general, I must have contrasted very strangely with a man so handsomely dressed, six feet high and of faultless form. But this was not a matter that I thought of until afterwards. And the terms that Grant asks of Lee are exactly what you would expect from the River Queen doctrine. Absolutely no punishment for men or officers. The men must surrender their military arms, but could keep all of their personal arms, and the men and the officers could keep their horses as their personal property. As Grant explained to Lee, they had waged total war. Now it was time to wage total peace. And so Lee surrendered his forces under these conditions. When Lee did that, and he wired Jeff Davis, the presidency of the Confederacy, Davis was furious, and Davis issued an order, an executive order, 
in which he countermanded Lee's surrender order and told all of his soldiers to go into full terrorist cell mode, to break into small, discrete bands, and to move into northern cities to begin a campaign of terror against northern civilians. Lee was understandably absolutely horrified by this. He hated public speaking, but he gave one speech to all of his men in the entire Civil War, and this is what happened, being described by a man who was witnessing this speech. Lee wrote out to his men to countermand President Davis's orders. He declared them null and void. The universal desire to express to him the unabated love and confidence of the army had led to the formation of the gunners of a few battalions of artillery along the roadside with orders to take off their hats in silence as Lee rode by. But when he approached, the men could not be restrained, and they burst into the most wild cheering, General Lee! General Lee! General Lee! General Lee stopped his horse, and after gaining silence, made the only speech to his men that he made during the entire war. He was very brief. He gave absolutely no excuses or apologies for his surrender, but said that he had done all in his power for his men, and he urged them to get home quickly and quietly, to get home as soon as possible, and to be citizens as good to the United States as they had been soldiers to the Confederacy. Now that is the essence of character. That is the essence of virtue of Republican manhood. Privately, Lee said, we did all we could to appeal to the Lord of Lords, to the God of battles, but he decided against us. Let us continue with our lives. Right, that, that's incredible. And what do we find after that surrender on April 9th, on April 10th and 11th, the Union men and the Confederate men have prayer sessions. They play cards with one another. They have huge, kind of great awakening festivities altar calls, all kinds of religious services. Grant does everything he can to send his medical corps into the Confederate men and to heal them wherever possible to take care of the wounded. And then on April 12th, we have one of the most astounding events in all of American history. We have the formal surrender in which all of Lee's army lines up one by one and they turn in all of their public arms and flags. But as they do this, they march through an absolute gauntlet of Union soldiers on either side, on their right and on their left, saluting them for almost eight hours without one derogatory, derogatory comment being said through all of this. Right? As Joshua Chamberlain, who was a classicist, from Bowdoin College and a general in the army. As he said, this was honor answering honor. As men of near blood born made nearer by blood shed, on our part the Union, not a sound or a trumpet more, nor a roll of a drum, nor a cheer, nor a word, nor a whisper of, of vainglory, nor a motion of man standing again at, at uh, order, but an odd stillness. Reluctantly, with agony of expression, the Confederates tenderly folded their flags. They were battle-worn and torn, blood-stained. They were heart-holding colors, and they laid them down, and some frenziedly rushed from their ranks, kneeling over them, clinging to them, pressing their lips to them, all the while with burning tears. But I tell you, in this surrender, we saw that brave men may become good friends. Never should we blame the Confederates too much, nor should we blame ourselves for not blaming them more. Although, as we believed, it was fatally wrong in striking at the old flag, misreading its deeper meaning in the innermost law of the people's life, blind to the signs of the times and the march of men, they fought as they were taught, true to such ideals as they saw, and they put their best cause forward. For us, the fellow soldiers, 
we were suffering as well the same fate of arms. We could not look into those bronze, brave, southern faces, and those battered flags we had met on so many battlefields where glorious manhood had lent a glory to the earth that bore it, and think of anything petty like personal hate or mean revenge. Whoever, whoever had misled these men, we had not. We had led them back home. Whoever had made this quarrel, we had not. It was a remnant of the inherited curse of sin, and we had purged it away with blood offerings. That's a stunning way to look at this. And of course, at the same moment that the surrender is happening, we have the murder of Abraham Lincoln. And that changes everything, as we'll talk about after your exam. But you can imagine when you have all of these volunteers on the field, men volunteering over and over and over again, 94% of all Union men were volunteered. The draft in the Union Army didn't even take effect until the late summer of 1863, a full two years into the war. But 94% of Union men were volunteered. And they volunteered because they believed in the Republic. They believed that the Republic stood for something. They believed in the founding. And because of that, they persevered. And as we see here in what Chamberlain says, the American soldiers of the Union Army should not be blamed but they should be understood, as well as the Confederate soldiers, as all Americans. We had this war, and now there will be no punishment, but everybody goes home. And we make the thing as it was, with that one huge critical exception, the 13th Amendment is now in effect. And that 13th Amendment will forever fulfill the meaning of the founding. It will fulfill the meaning of the U.S. Constitution. And certainly what we know is that now, finally, as Lincoln said, with the 13th Amendment and with the end of the war, we can truly have malice toward none and charity for all. We can bind up the nation's wounds and achieve a just and a lasting peace. All right, I want to conclude this with one last story. Again, to think about how unusual this war was. And it's the story of Hillsdale College. I don't know how many of you have been told this or how many of you know this, but at the very beginning of the American Civil War, on the first day that Lincoln called up volunteers to fight for the Union cause, almost every sing single male student on Hillsdale's campus, almost 400 of them, volunteered to fight for the American Civil War on the Union side. There is no other college in the North, not Harvard, not Yale, not Albion, not one college in the entirety of the American Union in the North that can say the same thing. This is Hillsdale's unique legacy. And Hillsdale men joined a variety of different regiments, but we find them most especially concentrated in the 2nd Michigan, in the 4th Michigan, and in the 24th Michigan. And the next time that you guys are on campus and you come over to Delp Hall to see me in Delp 403, if you walk around to our seminar room, you will look, and you should, at the paintings in that room because they are dedicated to the Hillsdale soldiers who fought at the Battle of Gettysburg on July 1st and July 2nd of 1863. And Hillsdale men did not just fight at Gettysburg. In many ways, they played the absolutely crucial role on the first and the second days of Gettysburg. On the first day of Gettysburg, Union troops were outnumbered about 10 to 1. Gettysburg is a little Lutheran town that sits right on the edge of some very small Appalachian mountains, but compared to the mountains in the region, it is the highest spot by far, and there are about three distinct peaks just to the east and the south of Gettysburg. Anyone who control the, controls those peaks will control the entire surrounding area for miles. When Lee invaded Pennsylvania in 1863, his goal was to take his troops all the way to march on New York 
and burn it down, and then down to Washington and Philadelphia and burn them down as well. This was not some raid where they might take a few crops. They were intent on burning down at least three American cities. And the 24th Michigan, along with the Iron Brigade, five regiments, not much of them left, happened to be at Gettysburg on the first day of that battle, seeing exactly what the Confederates were trying to do. They were outnumbered 10 to 1, that is the Union soldiers, Hillsdale men were outnumbered 10 to 1. The Confederate soldiers were moving into Gettysburg, and so what Hillsdale soldiers did is they placed themselves on the road blocking the western entrance into the city. So Confederate troops outnumbering the Union troops 10 to 1 are moving into Gettysburg. And our men, your fellow students, your classmates from many, many, many years ago, they bottleneck themselves in a little gap on the road coming into the town. And they told themselves they absolutely knew they would die. There was no possibility they would get out of this alive. But if they could die with enough ferocity and dignity, they could prevent the Confederacy from moving in. The Confederacy would be fooled into thinking there were actually more men than they were. And believe me, you guys have to go back to Thermopylae because what our men did that day was they did exactly what Leonidas and his 300 Spartans did at the Battle of Thermopylae. They bottlenecked themselves, and they fought absolutely fiercely. Here is what one historian, Bruce Catton, has written about this. So, the 24th Michigan, that's us. And here in the middle of it all sat the 24th Michigan with a county judge for a colonel and a county sheriff for lieutenant colonel and all the line officers carrying presentation swords, the regiment that had once been ostracized because its valor had been unproven. But since Fredericksburg, the regiment had been accepted. But in the unfathomable economics of army life, the men seemed to have felt that they still owed the rest of the brigade something. And here on Seminary Ridge, the bill had come for payment. Three times, Colonel Morrow, had sent back word that the opposition was untenable, and each time General Wadsworth grimly ordered him to hold the line. Some of the survivors remembered forming line of battle six times that hot afternoon, with the rank battle fog lying low under the trees and the unappeasable enemies coming in from all directions at once. Four color bearers, Hillsdale men, were killed, and the regiment stagged towards the rear, and Colonel Morrow ordered the fifth color bearer to jab the flagstaff in the ground and stand beside it for a rally. That man was killed before he could obey. Morrow himself took up the flag and waved it, and a private ran up and took it away from him, muttering that it wasn't up to a colonel to carry the regimental flag. And then this private was killed, and another took the staff, and then he too was shot, and Morrow got the flag after all, after which a bullet creased his skull, and he himself went down. Now, I went to Notre Dame for my undergrad, and a lot of Notre Dame men have given a lot during the wars. They gave a lot during the Civil War, during World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and all of the wars in the Persian Gulf. But nothing that I have ever read or encountered comes close to what Hillsdale students did there on July 1st and July 2nd of 1863. Had those Hillsdale men not been there, had they not been liberally educated, had they not known the story of Leonidas, had they not understood that this was a grand last stand made in the name of something much greater than themselves, the entire world could have changed. The Confederates may have gained heart, and even if the Hillsdale men had fought just a little less bravely, maybe the Confederates would have found the will to keep breaking through the enemy and take that high ground, and from there, destroy New York, destroy Philadelphia, destroy Washington, D.C., and destroy any chance the Republic would ever have of solving things through reunion. They would, have re they would have destroyed Abraham Lincoln's chance for re-election in 1864. In other words, and don't ever take this for granted, every day, 
and every moment we all make moral decisions. Those moral decisions are not abstractions. The fate of the universe can hang on what seems like the most minor decision we make. Those Hillsdale men were in the right place at the right time. Don't ever, ever forget that. God bless you guys. I will see you in office hours tomorrow if you're so willing. And if not, you'll hear from me on Friday for the midterm. Thank you.